Welcome everyone. Glad to see you on my channel. Today I will tell you about an unusual story. An amazing story about companionship and love. I wish you a pleasant audience. The ground was covered with knee, deep snow as far as the eye could see. The frosts slightly shrouded the cities and nature, covering everything, forcing people to huddle in warm dwellings. It seemed to be quite usual weather at this time of year for these places, but every time Oliver admired, I guess, including the opportunity to admire, it did push the successful businessman to build his mansion away from the hustle and bustle of the world. There, in the house, decorated externally as a huge carved tower, he liked to go out on the balcony in the frosty winter morning with a cup of coffee and admire the nature around him. Remarkably, he was not tired of the monotony of the landscape, but was as energized by the coffee. His wife did not share his admiration, but loved her husband, so she left the city comfort for him. However, there was clearly no shortage of comfort in the country house. Oliver went home after a hard but productive day's work. Now he felt tired, but it was pleasant. It was like carrying a burden, pouring out the contents and walking on with an empty sack. He dropped his burden. Two important timber contracts had been signed. The first, the bigger one, was going abroad and promised big profits from the Chinese. The second state order was needed, not for profit, but to lubricate the gears of the first. The forest fed the human. The businessman valued nature, not as a resource for enrichment, but simply as a phenomenon. He was the son of a forester from a remote village in the forest, so he grew up to look strong. He was a big, big bear with bear-like health. His character was just like this animal. He was not in a hurry to make decisions, all carefully thought and weighed. He took a decision as if the bear had struck with his paw. Once, and it's done. At the same time, his father taught him to be thrifty with nature. That is why his nickname among businessmen was firmly fixed on him as Leshy, the mystic defender of the forest. Even when he first got out of the office and said goodbye to the staff, he called his wife. How's my bead? How's my bead? said the businessman into the tube. From the outside, it looked quite funny. A big, bearded, brutal man and humming into the tube like a baby. It was silly to be like that. He could only afford to be direct with his wife Elizabeth or Eliza in everyday life. She was offended by Eliza at first, but then humbled herself, as it was useless to change the bear's mind. It was easier not to stand in the way. You have three beads. Which one do you want me to pass? Joked on the other side of the tube spouse. Yes, leave the main one to me. You do not want something like that today, asked the husband. I want you to come quickly, that's all, she answered nonchalantly. You know, herring, or whatever you pregnant women eat at bedtime. He was having fun, and he shared that mood through jokes. And herrings and toothpaste I don't want. I don't want strawberries picked under a full moon either. And no melon and ketchup. All right, sunshine. I'm on my way. Oliver loved those moments of tenderness at a distance, especially when his beloved woman did the test and the little unit of society had to double up. Two more, a boy and a girl. The businessman had dreamed all his life of a large family like the one he had, only to provide for it, to live not like his five brothers and sister when they slept on a warm stove in the summer and grew up in constant cramped quarters. To have a big house, a big family, and everyone was friendly. And so his dreams gradually came true. He was able to build a big house. His wife was getting ready to give him two firstborn children, and everything was going smoothly in a way that even sometimes didn't believe. For all these reasons, he was in a hurry to get home. Of course, he kept within limits, and on the road, he did not rush. The principle do no harm, not only to nature, but also to people was ingrained in his subcortex. The city sailed leisurely. Here and there he saw traffic lights, 
which were so covered with snow that their light was almost invisible, barely breaking through the veil. As a consequence, accidents here and there, or just accidents here and there, or just accident. Carefully avoiding the problem areas, the man finally made it out of the city and felt freer on the road. Fortunately, the highway outside the city was somehow better and cleaner than the populated area itself, where the abundance of cars turned the road into a trip through mush. Oliver drove quite far out of town, whistling a simple tune to the beat of the radio. It was involuntary, a childhood habit he had picked up from traveling with his father. Suddenly a huge shadow crossed the road and disappeared into the snowdrift by the curb. Wow, there are bunnies, the businessman exclaimed with surprise and slowed down. Neither in front nor behind there was not even a hint of the headlights of other cars. The man was in the middle of the track alone. He rubbed his eyes, contemplating fatigue. Huge hairs no longer flashed by. But how could there be a man here in this weather? It couldn't be. Oliver decided to take a few minutes and walk to the place of his unusual vision. He noticed footprints on the road that had already begun to be covered by new snow. He took a closer look. Human footprints. It wasn't a vision, though. What kind of crazy soul could have wandered in here of its own free will? And was it of its own free will? In such speculation, the man reached the place where the shadow had disappeared. A tramp was lying unconscious on the side of the road in a snowdrift, and he too was covered with snow a little at a time. And Oliver realized that he had simply been sent by the hand of Providence to save this poor man. Man, he called out. He didn't respond. Get up, man! Lishiai shouted louder and rubbed the man's shoulder. It came out from the big man rather roughly and strongly, so much so that the tramp even groaned as if barely audible alive. The businessman's moan was enough for him to act. He picked up the frail hobo like a kitten and carried him to his car. On the way, he shook him like a rag to bring him to his senses. And needless to say, he shook the snow off the man so as not to drag the moisture into the interior of the expensive car. The rescued man still did not want to come to his senses. The rescuer decided that this would not be the way to go and he would warm the grandfather up at home. He could tell he was an elderly man by the beard and the web of wrinkles on his unconscious face. There was no more time to consider the stranger, a bum and a bum, and the hell with it. Still a human being, he drove and thought about what he was going to tell his wife. Oliver looked in the rearview mirror, an ordinary man, inconspicuous, beaten by life. He did not smell of booze, which was already a big plus for his future communication with the businessman, because Oliver did not drink alcohol, considering it a usual poison. And what man in his right mind would poison himself and pay money for it? He took a closer look at the clothes of the rescued man. What could he say? A tramp, after all. He could smell it, but there was no glad tidings. Everything was patched and repatched, and it was generally wild. How did this genius have the brains to go out of town in such light clothes and such a bitter cold? Actually, that was a separate question. Why was this bum not in a warm basement near a heating main, but in the middle of nowhere? Where am I? Sounded a weak voice behind me warm and cozy. Of course I understand that life is hard these days, but the wolves in the woods would not say thank you for the free meat. Black humor diffused the atmosphere in Oliver's opinion, at least for himself. Who are you, man? Your savior, my name, is Oliver. Thank you, Oliver. You saved me from the blizzard. I'll get out, and he reached for the car door. Well, well, first of all, what's your name? Secondly, I don't think the wolves came after us, but there's plenty more where that came from. If you're a big animal feeder, I'm the only rescuer around here, aren't I? With these words, the owner of the car clicked the door lock and the vagrant had no more way to escape. My name is George. I'm rather embarrassed to be causing you all this trouble. It was either that the tramp had not yet recovered or that he did not care 
but he was calm and reacted melancholically to the blocked doors. But where are we going? To my house. Where else? Another five kilometers and we'll be there. You will spend the night at my place, and then we will decide what to do with you and what beasts to feed you. No need to feed me. I'm already unpalatable. Languidly smiled the tramp. Elizabeth accepted George's appearance very favorably, for it was at least some variety of communication beyond what she already had. It was her bear who talked to hundreds of people in a day at work, and in the evenings wanted only to be silent and listen to his wife, as if she were a canary in a golden cage, and had been silent all day before with her song. The first night, the tramp was laid in the living room by the fireplace, which had been kindled to make George more comfortable. They gave him hot tea and fed him, and then the strength left the languid guest. The host left him and all the questions that concerned the misadventures of the night guest until morning. Oliver took his time, not hurriedly, with pleasure, went out to the balcony. He performed the daily routine, morning balcony, robe and cup of coffee, the blizzard had fought productively on the winter front and had now calmed down after the night. The whole neighborhood was covered with snow as far as the eye could see. Oliver involuntarily marveled at the beauty untouched by man. Such moments are worth living for. Such landscapes always inspired the businessman to work, and he was ready to run like a squirrel in a wheel, so that in the morning here on this balcony to meet a new day, he took a sip of a strong, aromatic drink, and then turned his gaze down to the yard. He had safely forgotten to put the car in the garage while he was rescuing and warming the stray. Now it looked like a noticeable snowdrift against the snow-covered field. The snowstorm had done its best. Even the fence hardly stood out from under the snow. The workday had abruptly turned into a day off. That's it. That's it. That's it. Oliver exhaled, doomfully sipping his coffee phlegmatically and increasingly shedding the remnants of sleep. The entrepreneur pondered what he had planned for the day. It turned out that there were no particularly important cases where his deputies couldn't do without him. Well, that's how the stars worked out. Elizabeth was awake. I see my beer is sullen. It means the weather is bad. Am I right? You bet you did, darling. You bet you did, darling. You bet you did. It seems that I am unscheduled today, but with you. He smiled and kissed his beloved on the cheek. How is our vagabond? I think to involve him in community service, if he warmed up, as you know, of course. But those bums make bad workers. They drink and want more than they work. No, I didn't smell any of that yesterday. He wasn't drunk. And that's the best part. His appearance on the road is a mystery. Anyway, right now, we'll talk to him. Maybe he'll work for us. Oliver said thoughtfully, pulling on his warm winter pants. I don't mind if you want. The businessman went down to the first floor. The guest was already awake and was busy dismantling the fireplace. He was quite awake and fidgeting smartly without any ineptitude. It was obvious that the man was accustomed to labor. It was obvious that the man was accustomed to labor. Good morning, George. Oliver greeted him, putting on his work coat. And good morning to you, Oliver. For a tramp, he was attentive enough to remember the patronymic of the man, even in his delirium. How are you? Are you awake? You were a sight for sore eyes yesterday? Oliver held out his hand to the rescued tramp. He rubbed them on his outfit and extended his hand in return. They stood for a while, silently looking at the incipient cheerful light. Thank you, you saved me. What do I owe you? Yes, I have an idea. Have you had breakfast? No. I'm not accustomed to house sitting, protested the old man, and the loud rumbling of the stomach only confirmed it. Well, then, let's go get something to eat. I'll outline the work to be done. While the tramp greedily gulped down the hastily concocted sandwiches and hot tea, 
like a pelican gulping fish. Oliver regarded him. He was an ordinary, unremarkable man closer to old age, his gray stubble and hair making it impossible to determine the numbers roughly. His image was both appealing with something elusive and at the same time repulsive. A tramp is a tramp, and the poverty of his clothes spoke for itself. I'm just looking and thinking, where did you come from on the road? Care to share? The homeless man thought about it and went back to his old occupation, experiencing a sandwich. It seemed more important to him than idle conversation. Oliver nodded understandingly and took his own breakfast, deciding to have another cup of coffee. It was going to be an unusual day, so they might as well get out of the cannon. Fifteen minutes later they went out into the courtyard. The tramp also got an old work jacket and warmer pants. There were more than enough shovels to shovel the snow. The owner of the house was notable for his harding. The rest of the house was still asleep. Elizabeth had apparently decided to spend more time in bed. Um, let's clean up from there and from there and don't hit the car. I could use it. Maybe we'll save someone else. Oliver winked and the men began playfully throwing the snow around, clearing a large path so that in the end they could freely reach the car. They were like an elephant in a mooch. The big forester held the shovel like a toy and shoveled the snow far and playfully. While George was wiry and the shovel was quite a noticeable burden for him, given his weakened body. Thus passed a couple of hours. The tired men stopped to take a break. Oliver wasn't much tired, but you couldn't tell from the hobo that he was exhausted either. The businessman was growing more and more convinced that the bum could be put to work. George, there were sandwiches then. And now you tell me how you ended up in the middle of nowhere in a snowstorm. That's strange. Did someone hurt you? All right, but don't laugh, warned the tramp. All right then, dare. Do not lie. I went to hang bird feeders in the forest. Made a route beforehand, crumbled some breadcrumbs. I love birds. It's a harsh winter. Figured even if I saved one, it wouldn't be for nothing. I tried, but it was a little late for me to get out. It was light while I was walking and hanging, but it's winter. It gets dark early. And then there was a snowstorm on the edge of town. It snowballed and swirled. And when I came out to the road, I had no strength at all. Oliver was used to understanding people, to see when they were lying and when they were telling the truth. He did not fail to make use of the skill he had acquired this time. If the businessman was not wrong, the tramp was telling the truth. It was wild to hear such a thing. You're an odd man. You saved some bird or not, and you almost ruined your own life. Was it worth it? It was worth it? It was worth it, the bum answered stubbornly and smiled. Now I'll save your iron horse from the snow instead of birds. So they spent a few more hours at work. They did not take a break for lunch, enthusiastically waving the shovels and finish when the sun was about to set. The path in the yard and behind the gate to the road had been cleared. The road from here was still blocked with snow, and there was only hope that it would be cleared because there were still some two hundred meters to the track. Tired from the day, the men entered the house, put some wood in the fireplace, threw their working clothes on a hanger by the exit, and went to empty the fridge. The master of the house was not stingy and cooked plain noodles flotsky in addition to sandwiches. The women are slacking today, said the businessman thoughtfully. Women. And why women? You're something else. Do you think one woman can manage with this house? I did not have such a huge house. I don't know. I have a wife, Elizabeth. You could have seen it yesterday. I vaguely remember. She's pregnant, right? That's right. And the other one's a housekeeper named Emily. She's a young girl, but she knows her stuff. And the others come from the village nearby. Guards and maids and things like that. Cooks, by the way, I do not keep. So for the future, you'll cook for yourself. What future? George was surprised. Let me explain. I like the way you work today. Ever since this morning, I've been thinking about getting a full-time janitor and a handyman. And then you showed up out of the blue. So consider yourself interviewed with a shovel. 
no harm in salary. And you'll be warm and nourished. Frankly, I'm surprised. I thought it was just to thank you, and I have a house. A dilapidated one, though. A plate appeared on the table in front of George, spreading the mouth-watering aroma of stew around the kitchen. The hobo swallowed his saliva frantically and pounced on the food. He ate quickly, as if he could have had his food taken away from him, and then asked for more. As he ate a second portion, he satiatedly unstrained. I agree. From that day on, George lived with this life. One could safely say that by chance he was thrown to the wayside of life and immediately ascended from the dirt to the ranks. And the work was not too burdensome for the still strong old man. He cleaned the yard in the morning, and then, depending on his mood, he was on the maid's staff or his new headache, the housekeeper. For some reason the girl disliked the tramp from the start. And while she treated the other visiting employees politely and on the job, she brought up the old man with some inexplicable hatred. He did not know the reason, he just tolerated the mocking tone, sometimes inadequate nagging and assignments from the young boss. Emily often threw George a job that was clearly out of the old man's line of work. More than that, it was humiliating, and sometimes it seemed as if she was creating it for him. For example, by shoving a strange amount of toilet paper mixed with wet wipes and even a rag down the toilet. Down the toilet strange combination. He thought at first that it was the mistress quirk, but he was embarrassed to ask. He was vaguely familiar with plumbing, but there was a plumber in the house and the old man quickly learned the basics of this profession. Or one day, a window in the attic broke suspiciously accidentally near the roof a snowstorm obviously could not have done such a thing. There were no trees nearby, and the old man had to climb to the roof without a safety net. He nearly rolled off it several times, but he fixed the broken window. When the owner arrived in the evening, the old man remained silent out of modesty. He thought the businessman already knew. He was just happy with everything. And the wage of the handyman, which the former vagabond had become, were such that George would not have been surprised if these were the real demands of the employer. Oliver, meanwhile, had got the business winded, and he would show up at home to see his wife, meet her on the balcony in the morning, and leave for new business. There was no more chance to clear the yard together. So at home the worker was entirely at the mercy of the young housekeeper. She was good-looking, slender brunette of about twenty-five, and among themselves the staff discussed why Elizabeth, the mistress, is not jealous of such a tempting forbidden fetus, while she is pregnant. The guys from the security company who periodically came to check the alarm system at the sight of her almost drooled. However, there was no reciprocity from her. The bird is not their flight. George had a friendly relationship with the other servants of the forester's house. The old man was inquisitive and helped others in every way he could when he was free, and took lessons at the same time. He asked the gardeners about the trees in the spring, and he spied recipes from the cook, and tried to repeat them. It was as if the man had been born again, and as inquisitive as a child. Seeing this, Emily only rolled her eyes grudgingly. Where are you going, old man? His George was patient. He understood that he was a nobody here, but the resentment sometimes clung to his heart. One day he could not stand it. And on another ridiculous nagging as gently as possible said, Daughter, I'm looking at you, and you still resent. Do not like me, but am I not doing a good job? Why are you doing this to me? Emily stopped in mid-sentence and then gasped in indignation. What kind of daughter am I to you, you tramp? Well, Emily... What have I done wrong to you? Why are you looking at me like Lenin at the bourgeoisie? The old man squinted his eyes. You're not wanted here, old man. You're snooping around, probably looking for something to steal. The landlord took you in for nothing. I know your tribe hissed the housekeeper like a snake. Don't get so hot. I ain't stolen nothing, and I ain't going to. I like it here, and I like it here. And I like my job, too, though it can be difficult. My boss saved me. I owe him my life. 
Why would I steal? The old man tried to justify himself. You cannot prove it to me. I am not interested. Better run to work. Vaughn, get some wood, and I'm watching you, you tramp. The manager turned around and went somewhere to the second floor. George stood for a while and went to do his errand. Though, to tell the truth, there was more than enough wood for the fireplace, and it was just another nagging of the power, a custom idler. The days passed. Blizzards often blanketed the neighborhood with white snow, but the chief never got a day off. Now he was always anxious to get home before dark, because Alita was due to give birth soon, and he did not want to miss that moment. They had an agreement between them, that the birth would be partnered and Oliver was to accompany his wife the entire time. This process was not. He could not control it. On this day, the man was a little late. Business was delayed, and he arrived when it was already dark. The businessman went out, breathed in the frosty winter air, and looked at the stars. It was another passion of his that even his wife did not know about. Once upon a time, as a child like many, he wanted to be an astronaut, and so he often escaped in the evenings from his cramped house and looked at the stars. His father would sometimes join him and tell him about the constellations. The businessman was now admiring the sky, listening to the silence. Suddenly a distant whimper came to him. Flora, his beloved sheepdog, was about to give birth to a horde of puppies. He was even happy about it. It was somewhat symbolic of his twins. They would grow to be faithful companions. At least two puppies he planned to keep. Oliver walked into the barn and was dumbfounded. As a woodsman's son, he was used to all sorts of interaction with animals. But there was clearly something wrong here. The dog looked at his owner with a guilty look. The dog looked at his owner with a guilty look. It wasn't me. It did it to itself. The first puppy was halfway out and didn't want to move any further. Laura agonized, whimpering, but continued to lie helplessly on the pile of rags that had been laid out for her since the cold weather began. Oliver stepped out in bewilderment and headed for the house. A vet to be called to such a wilderness. Only a true psychopath would come here at this hour and on this road. Personally, he would send a client like him, and he would be right. The businessman entered the house. George was sitting by the fireplace reading a book which clearly contradicted the image of a vagabond. Oliver paid no attention to this entertaining fact, for he was too impressed by what he had just seen. Good evening, George. Cheerio, Oliver. A thought suddenly occurred to the man. Listen, you like animals, don't you? I'd die for birds. So, and grinned the former vagabond and looked intently at his employer. Then... I will need your help with the profile. When? Right now. Let's go. The businessman led the old man to a whimpering Flora. She looked at the men incredulously, sluggishly, sluggishly, trying to wag her tail as if to apologize. The tramp pulled Oliver aside and squatted in front of the sheepdog, muttering something soothing to her like some kind of shaman. The sheepdog listened intently to the muttering as if she understood every word. Then the old man began stroking the belly of the businessman's pet. It was as if he was giving the animal some kind of specific massage. Oliver stood perplexed. Flora stopped whimpering, and in five minutes the barn was filled with the squeals of newborn puppies, who resented being taken out of their mother's such a comfortable womb and demanded to eat. Flora looked at her babies, then at her owner, as if asking what it was. What was it? Already in the house, Oliver asked his worker. The birth of a new life, the latter evasively replied with a chuckle in his grey beard. You're a strange man. You almost killed yourself for the birds. And now you let my beautiful Flora give up the baby. Who are you after that vagabond? I think that's what homeless people used to call me. Don't give me that. I grew up in the countryside and I know the value of people like you. I don't know why you ended up on the street, but I can see that you're not eager to tell. But in any case, I'm glad I met you on the highway. Yes, you know, Oliver. 
It makes me happy. He George remarked quietly, silent about the housekeeper's humiliation. A week later, an event occurred that shook the couple's home more than the auspicious birth of the puppies. Elita went into labor. For the first time in his life, Oliver regretted living out of town. Now with excitement, he was ready to sell the house, the business, anything, as long as his beloved was in the hospital now. Elizabeth screamed without holding back. There was not a corner of the house where the screams of pain from ordinary contractions did not reach. The whole house was on its ears. My husband was beside me. The ambulance is on its way, honey. Just a little more patience. The businessman was fussing over his wife, and the housekeeper was right behind her. Oliver was lying to his wife for the first time in his life. True, it was a lie for the greater good. He called an ambulance, but the paramedic warned that they would take a long ride if they made it at all because of this bad weather. So the woman in labor needed as much peace as possible. And perhaps for the first time in his life, the confident entrepreneur did not know what to do. He certainly didn't know how to deliver a baby, especially not his beloved wife. Leave us alone for a while, Emily, Elizabeth asked. I'll be right outside the door. Call me if you need anything. The manager nodded and went out. Tell me honestly, are we going to get to the hospital? Sure, I called the doctors. Have you seen the weather outside the window? Why are you lying to me? A spasm twisted the laboring woman, and Oliver grimaced like a toothache. He found his wife's agony hard to bear. Now what are we going to do? It's twins. Do you have a plan? His wife panted and continued to ask him questions. Everything will be all right, Fun the businessman repeated over and over again, though he himself did not believe it. Some kind of verbal altercation was heard in the corridor, and this saved from a pile of awkward questions. Where are you going, dummy? A woman's voice was indignant. Make way. This time the voice of the quiet, phlegmatic George sounded confident, and even a little threatening. I was told not to disturb you. You were not supposed to be disturbed. Without knocking, a tramp rushed into the room. Gentlemen, I cannot sleep listening to my mistress in pain. Has your water broken? I tried to hold him off. Emily made excuses. Bring lukewarm water and towels. The old man nodded at her. Have you lost your mind, bum? It's not like giving birth to a dog. The housekeeper started to say so, but then she stared at her landlord and went to carry out the hobo's orders. Actually, she's right. Elizabeth is not Flora. Do you know what you're doing? Noticed Oliver sullenly. Oliver, the birthing woman, squeezed her husband's hand. We know there won't be any doctors. There's no choice. Oliver saved me from death back then. It was my turn to truly pay my debt. He's on my list. Animal man. It's all one. This is the mystery of the birth of life. This is the mystery of the birth of life as the old man reassured the businessman. Oliver's hands trembled. It was the hardest decision he had ever made. The tramp interpreted it correctly. Oliver, you'd better stay on the other side of the door for now. I won't do any harm. Let Emily be on the other side of the door. The businessman looked at his wife. She nodded like a wound. Up tin soldier, he went out, and the door closed behind him. He retired to his office because it had the best noise insulation. He wanted to, to hide, to fall onto the ground, not to hear even that distant, muffled by several walls, cry of his wife. Oliver took out from the safe a gift Cuban cigar, which had once been presented to him by his partners, and smoked it. Though he had never had such a habit before, bitterness stiffened his throat, and the clouds of smoke plunged the room into a haze. He did not know how much time had passed because the man had simply lost track of it. He was roused from his unhappy thoughts by Emily's unabashed knocking. Yes, a homeless man is calling you. Emily, damn it, I don't want to hear that again. He has a name, and given your age difference with him, his middle name too. 
The usually phlegmatic Oliver exploded. Sorry, I stand corrected. How did it go? He asked as he went along. You had a healthy son and daughter. He made it through. The manager grinned. The manager grinned as if she did not give good news, but spoke of trouble. The businessman flew into the bedroom in a whirlwind. The exhausted but contented Elizabeth, with a feverish light in her eyes, looked at her husband and smiled. On either side of her lay two newborn little men. The old man standing a little to the side was a little poor but content. He looked something like a kindly disheveled housekeeper. The tramp nodded to his employer and walked out, leaving the couple alone with their little happiness. The ambulance did not reach the Harrow right. However, the paramedic still had a guilty look on his face as he approached. Good morning. Sorry, bad weather. Where's the mother in labor? How is she good? That's all, said the woman's husband. How is everybody? The doctor looked at the paperwork. You had a planned Caesarea, and it's not so easy to give birth to twins nowadays. And who could deliver a baby? You don't look like a medical expert. Oliver got a laugh. The whole event really was like some silly, unreal dream. The bum delivering the baby. The wife confiding in a tramp she'd known for a week. Just a series of fantastical events. And the old man, you see, he laughed and coughed up too much nicotine. Yes, that was certainly the last cigarette. There he is the man to talk to. The businessman pointed to George, who was standing a little away. The paramedic looked at the chart. Stop joking around. In my thirty years of practice, I've never seen a paramedic deliver a woman in twins. It would have to be some kind of miracle worker. There is a miracle worker. Ask him yourself. Our savior, our visual savior, come here. Teach our Esculapians. Your miracles... The paramedic looked at Oliver disapprovingly. They didn't drive all night to get here to make jokes. And here's something like this. The old man walked over and looked over and looked the doctor straight in the eye. He squinted, looked closely, and then his eyes widened. My God, are you still alive? I didn't expect to see you here, and I didn't expect to see you at all anymore. The paramedic exclaimed and turned to Oliver. Well, it all makes sense then. What about the woman in labor and the children? What will happen to them? Asleep, the babies are in perfect health, which is rare these days. Although with parents like that, it's not uncommon. Now I don't get it at all. Oliver was surprised. Shall I tell you? The paramedic asked the vagabond. Go ahead, Afeta, said the old man sadly and staggered tiredly inside to his usual place by the fireplace, as if the future conversation was unpleasant for him in advance. The paramedic began his story. I don't know where you found him, but it's nothing short of a miracle. He was the best obstetrician in the region, a talent that was just from birth. There's no other way to say it. I had just begun to practice after my internship, and he was already a personality with a capital letter. Conferences, articles, our George was praised everywhere. The most interesting thing is that his work was not just for show or to maintain his image. No, he really successfully put his findings into practice. By the way, he was against Caesarean section. He tried to do it only in the most extreme cases. But wait, I even picked him up on the highway. The man objected and briefly retold the story of George's rescue. You know more about the reason he was there. I can tell you the backstory. Our wizard obstetrician gave hundreds of lives in one. Until one moment, he and his family were in a car accident. A drunk driver swerved into oncoming traffic. His wife and son were killed on the spot, and he got away with a scratch. He was devastated by this injustice, and at first he withdrew into himself. Day by day he became more and more melancholy until he was in a full-blown depression. And it seems that we doctors know how to treat people, but we let ourselves down. He quit his job, and I never saw him again. 
We were not close enough for me to try to get him out of that state. And I was a new person, too. In a word, he didn't have a soul close to him. So he sank to the bottom, drinking with occasional drinking buddies. The black realtors didn't sleep. The apartment of the once famous obstetrician was safely taken away fraudulently. I have not heard from him since. The forester and the doctor were silent for a few minutes. If you have no complaint against us, or wish us to conduct the examination, sign here and here. Not to hold each other up, the businessman signed in the right places, said goodbye to the paramedic and went into the house. The old man sat staring into the fire as if mesmerized. Oliver sat down beside him. Why didn't you tell me right away and keep storming Emily? Who would have believed me? A homeless obstetrician is a monkey with a grenade. Believe it or not, Oliver, this is my first birth in ten years. If the situation hadn't compelled me, I wouldn't have started it. Did the paramedic tell you my whole story? Yeah, what are you going to do about it? Resuscitate your talent. You gave me a son and a daughter. You're a big shot. You need your own clinic. And I have options. Yes, let it be small in the beginning. It will be a good deed. The fever of enthusiasm took hold of Oliver, and his eyes burned with feverish fire. This look was understood only by Elizabeth's new mother, sleeping on the second floor. He had made his decision, and George had no chance to refuse. Talent. I have a talent for shoveling snow. The old man brushed it off. Yes. The Felcher said that my wife was supposed to be operated on by C-section, not by natural childbirth. Your talent could help a hundred more women in labor. Your talent could help a hundred more women in labor. The man did not let up. I used to be just a tramp or a bum, and now I'm just a slave. I don't belong to myself. The men fell silent, sipping their herbal green tea. Emily waited for the ambulance like manna from heaven. She was sure the paramedic would come in and see the tramp's shoddy work, and after that the old man would be kicked out of Oliver's house. From the first day she had disliked the old man, and she was not too sure of the reason for this hatred. Yes, a tramp, yes. His clothes left much to be desired, but he did not directly harm her. She wondered to herself. When she heard the paramedic story, the manager realized what it was about that damned old man that made her so angry. It was his initials that she had read on the plaque sitting in line in front of the office. She was only 18 at the time, had not yet seen life. Yesterday she had been a schoolgirl, and today she was a mother. She didn't ask for it, and she didn't want it. She was very scared. She hadn't yet spread her wings, and Chance was already ready to trim them treacherously. What about her education? What about her education? What about a career? The guy had been careless, and now she, Emily, was paying for his awkwardness. She came to the interruption and thought she was doing the right thing. She was still a child herself. She's not allowed. She doesn't want to, so she sat there. She was pummeling her soul wrestling with her protesting conscience against the murder, not noticing anything around her. A shadow hovered over her. Little girl, who are you waiting for? said the shadow. I'm waiting for Dr. George. Emily's voice faltered, and she squeaked the phrase like a mouse. It is I. Come on, you've been sitting here alone for hours. He glanced at his watch defiantly. The girl looked around. Apparently, the doctor's workday had already ended. Sorry, you should probably go home by now, said the girl. Well, no. If you've been waiting, come on in. The doctor did an examination. Well, Emily, you're doing great. There are no contraindications to pregnancy, and the baby definitely has no abnormalities. Give birth and be happy. The doctor smiled and gave the medical card to the girl card to the girl. Doctor, I came for something else. Timidly began Emily. I'm not ready to become a mother. You don't really ask the baby if you're going to conceive or not. If you have it, you have the baby. Now, there are no medical contraindications, and the term is enough. What do you mean enough? 
Maybe not for you, Emily, but you're already three months pregnant. I'm only 18. I've seen the chart. My verdict is, have the baby. After an abortion, you'll have complications that will make pregnancy seem like child's play. Plus, there's always the possibility that you won't be able to have any more children. But how do you feed? How do you support? I'm not even on my feet yet, let alone on my fiancé. And what about the groom? Well, he's not ready for a baby. All right, girl. Out of the question. I won't listen to anything. I've been through all this dozens of times. And every time I repeat, everyone was ashamed of those doubts. There will be no interruption, period. So, rest, good sleep, and a healthy diet. Here's more. I'll prescribe a couple of vitamins. Magnesium will not be superfluous. The doctor wrote a prescription and started to go home. Emily had nothing to say. The doctor's arguments were unassailable. His conscience won out. The girl went back in broken feelings. She still had a difficult conversation with her mother, who suspected nothing. What was there to say? The six-month deadline surprised even the mother. To be herself, it shocked everyone. My mother didn't understand. She screamed, called her a minor and a whore. She herself was dragging her daughter and now another load on her shoulders, so the mother did not hold back her emotions. The parent even went to the doctor and tried to bribe him for an abortion, but was thrown out the door. The mother came to terms with such an early grandchild. The next problem was the baby's father. The boy was young, and windlessness was a feature of his adolescence. He was clearly not ready for a family. When the girl told him the news that there would be no termination, he had a fit of hysteria. The man who had sworn his love whispered sweet words, was so confident and charming, was now screaming and swearing, and did not know where to put himself. At that moment, he was just pathetic. He ended up leaving her with a seven-month belly and found a new love without the univenisty belly Emily gave birth to a boy named him Matthew, a rare name, and honestly pulled her socially imposed maternal duty, enduring her mother's jabs and feeling unwanted. The father took absolutely no interest in the fate of his son. He probably didn't even know he had a son. She never filed for child support. Her whole life curdled into the screaming lump that wanted to eat, sleep, dirty diapers, cry, 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 and cry again. Sleep became a luxury, tension grew day by day. The young mother saw no way out of the whole situation. Eventually, after six years, she gave up. Her son did not arouse any maternal feelings, and she gave him up to the orphanage. A child is a child. But you have to love yourself first of all. That was the excuse for a young and now a free woman. The internet, women's forums, her friends, everything justified her. Even her mother, who at one time did not do the same to Emily, understood her daughter, although she belonged to a generation that had been raised on other values. If she remembered the doctor, it was only with hatred. Emily considered him the main culprit for all her misfortunes of the past year. One good thing was that he delivered a really good baby, without a C-section, quickly and quickly, as if it was like eating ice cream. However it was, the doctor took several women in labor per shift, and the line to him did not run out. Now the old man looked only remotely like his old self. And yet some barely recognizable traits had awakened in the manager's self-loathing. Now she finally understood the reason, and it became even more evident in the woman. The tramp was a constant reminder of her despicable action toward her own child no matter how she justified it. George looked for the steward to inquire about the amount of chores for the day, but found her nowhere. So he wandered around the house like a lonely man. Elizabeth, meanwhile, was strolling around the yard with a double stroller. Weather permitting. The house was empty. The doors of the master's study were open for some reason. The old man was drawn there in search of Emily. Maybe there, though George knew he didn't trust anyone with access to his study. 
it was exclusively his domain. He even did the cleaning himself. The obstetrician started sneaking around like a cat, smelling something wrong. He didn't think it was right, but his instincts told him it was the right thing to do. He peeked into the office. Emily was standing by the open safe with her back to the exit, taking pictures of some documents. What was particularly odd was that the safe was open, though only the businessman himself had access to it. Emily must have felt someone else's eyes on her, for she turned sharply toward the entrance. No one was there. Emily, the old man called somewhere near the stairs. The manager quickly collected all the documents in the old order and returned them to the safe, but her suspicions only increased. The old man must have seen something. We must take action. Despite the pile of house chores, he did not stop loving animals and helping his beloved birds. He hung several homemade feeders about a mile from his house, and if he had any free time, he would go and feed his charges. And so he did this time. He had no days off, but today was a day that had no other name. The hobo obstetrician walked along the road, clutching at the winter sun. In his hand, he had a small bag of grain and small pieces of lard especially for tits. The brethren of the birds were already used to the fact that there was always enough food in the wooden hanged houses, so they often settled on them. The wanderer felt like some kind of ancient guide who protects nature and lives in harmony with it. It was inspiring to live. As he no longer had people close to him, he was walking home in high spirits when he heard the roar of an engine behind him. From the sound of it, it was in Suve. The old man thought it was Oliver. Since you don't meet random people on this road, so he walked calmly, knowing that he would be bypassed. He was not. At the last moment, he bounced to the side of the road and fell face first into the snow. He tried to get up when he heard a voice behind him. He confirmed, a voice from a cop. Something heavy had hit him on the head. His sideways vision told him it was a crowbar. Then he turned his gaze to the snow in front of his face. Droplets of red dripped on it like a snowdrop in the frost. It was the last thing he saw before he lost consciousness. Bloody snow flew toward him and the wanderer fell into a maelstrom of unconsciousness. He woke up to a loud voice that growled like a bear. But the growl was contented, as if he had had enough honey and was in no mood for aggression. Nevertheless, that voice gave itself a bell-like chime in his head, hitting the hammer like the anvil that was the sufferer's head. There goes our sleeping beauty, muttered the same good-natured bear, but really quieter. The old man opened his eyes. The world was shifting, as if the old man were on the deck of a ship. He felt faint, so he hurried to close his eyes. That's right. Don't open your eyes. Don't risk it. It is not pleasant, the forester sympathized. Where am I? Where? At the hospital. You owe me again. What do you mean? George could hardly understand himself as a human being. Not that he remembered what had happened. You were saving nature again this time. Someone obviously doesn't like you. I, on the other hand, have my heart set on it. Did you see what kind of birds pecked you on the head? That would really help in the search. Honestly, I didn't see them. They hit me from behind. What for? I don't know who wants me. The old man had to make an effort to remember the details of the attack. No clues at all. It's hardly a rival gang of woodsmen you're taking jobs from. The businessman grinned wryly. There's only conjecture, but... They began the old man languidly. So tell us your guesses and don't keep us in suspense. We'll investigate them hot on the trail. The old man pulled himself together and told me about the case of the economy, which unknowingly opened the safe. He's got a snake on his back, and at the interview was such a pretty girl, and no complaints about the work. There were only fears, as if his wife would not be jealous of her, but nothing happened. And then it hit me. Anger boiled up in the businessman. 
and the old man knew that now the economy was in trouble. Wait, the old man called the businessman who was about to leave. He was surprised that he was called by his last name because he was not used to this kind of treatment, but he turned around and looked at the sick man questioningly. Don't be too hard on her, okay? She has a reason to hate me. The talented obstetrician must have told from memory the story of the girl's misadventures, of which he was aware. He only now remembered in the strong, confident, and prosperous woman that weepy, frightened little girl who, like everyone else, was afraid to give birth and whom he had persuaded to get rid of the baby. He did not see that healthy boy whom he had helped see the white light, which meant that something had happened to him that made him not with his mother. For this reason, the obstetrician felt a certain guilt over the boy's fate, and the master listened silently, attentively, and without emotion. His face expressed a sullen grimace, like that of a sleepy bear that had just come out of hibernation. When he had listened to the story to the end, he nodded silently and left the room. The old man leaned back on his pillow and fell into a sound sleep. All these stories and stories had drained him physically and mentally. So the weakened body used the best medicine, sleep. The maid had been beside herself ever since her employers had attacked the old man. Yes, she hated him, but she did not wish him dead. She merely wanted the tramp to stay out of the way of her competitors. They needed information concerning the master's affairs, and for a handsome fee, they would get all the data. Beyond that, Emily was no longer interested in the woodsman's fate. She wanted to go far away. All that was left was to hand over the flash drive with lots of pictures and documents she had taken. Now she was tormented by her conscience, both toward the old man and toward the old man and toward the owner. After all, the businessman had always treated her well. When Oliver arrived, the manager immediately realized that the businessman suspected something. It was as if not a man, but a black cargo cloud had emerged from the car. Instead of getting up and visiting his wife, as he usually did, he went to his office and from there called the woman to himself. For the first time ever, she entered, unabashedly, as if she were a schoolgirl. How do you do? she began. Come in and sit down. I know everything. The housekeeper sat down on a chair. Now it seemed to her like an electric chair. Did you have time to send it off? He was throwing phrases briefly as if he were chopping wood. No, she hadn't. She put the flash drive on the table in front of him. He gave vent to his emotions in the storage medium, which was guilty only of keeping other people's secrets, turned into a pile of useless shards under the blow of a huge fist. Ira shuddered. She was afraid of repeating the flash drive's fate and eyed her employer warily. You look right, my little dove. If it were up to me, I would not look at you as a woman. George put in a good word for you, so we will agree this way. There was no such thing as the flash drive. This conversation never happened. You didn't sell out to the competition. You'll work the same way you did before, with balance. Oliver, the manager, had tears of gratitude in her eyes. But she couldn't say anything. You don't have to thank me. It's better to see the old man. It turns out he's helped you out more than once. I'm ashamed. Then you still have a conscience. Dismissed. Tomorrow is the day off to visit the old man. George was very surprised to see Emily come into his room and not empty, handed, but with hotels. How do you do? Good day to you too, Emily. Did Oliver send you? He did, in part, but not quite. My conscience is killing me. I feel both guilt and the need to have a heart to heart talk. It's unusual for me, of course, given our past relationship, but I'm really happy about it. I want to ask you something. Do you remember? Yes, I remembered. I didn't realize what was going on until I heard your story. I want to make up and apologize for all the past we've had. I'm telling you, I acted like a mean old lady. Come on, don't be silly, daughter. 
He who remembers the past is out of sight. Tell me, where's that little boy you had? The housekeeper blushed thickly and looked down. There was an awkward silence in the room. She was gathering her thoughts. A heavy burden was weighing on the woman's soul, and the old man did not hurry her because the question was really delicate. He remembered that the boy was healthy, without pathology. Was he? His name is Matthew, finally mumbled the woman, and told the story of her misadventures before and after pregnancy, as well as the sad outcome for the innocent son. Eighteen years old, abandoned by all. Yes, I had made a mistake and I still intend to right it, she said firmly. It was as if the anger of past deeds had evaporated in her. It was a completely different person. Do you want to take him out of the orphanage? Yes, I do. I want to give him a happy childhood. That's why I took this dirty little job. It's my job, isn't it? I have the coordinates of the orphanage. And if you do not mind, let him call you grandfather. So there was another little helper in the house who followed his mother in everything, entertained the guards and the gardener, was overjoyed since her children now had an older friend and mentor. Matthew resembled one of Flora's little puppies who often ran after him. Oliver was proud of himself. This was the first major project he had invested in besides his construction timber trade. While the old man was in the hospital, the businessman was busy organizing the construction of a perinatal center. Right after giving birth, he noticed an abandoned building in the center of the city. It was quite expensive for a ruin because of its location, but the entrepreneur took a risk. He had to scrape through the piles and make every effort. But the construction began, and it should be noted that rather quickly a modern perinatal center grew up on the place of the wasteland and ruins, which had an opportunity to compete for the title of the most modern in the region. The old man did not know about all this, so Every time he was surprised by the owner who came to check on him. With a feverish gleam in his eyes, the entrepreneur wanted to crack up, but he could not tell about the whole process, which fascinated him like a little boy's new toy. On the day he was discharged, he stopped by to pick up the old man. The old man had no idea about the construction of the century, so he sat in the front seat without a second thought. So they drove through town. Suddenly, the businessman said, Tell me, do you trust me? Of course I do, was he replied. Then he'll close his eyes now. The obstetrician obeyed. They drove on for a while and then the car stopped. The old man saw a modern state. But the old man saw a modern state. Art building in front of him. The old man saw a modern building in front of him. What is it? Your perinatal center. I told you, you can't bury talent. Thank you. All the stunned old man could squeeze out. From then on, there was peace and tranquility in their home. Everyone missed the quiet, peaceful old man who was now devoted to his midwifery work. He tried to visit his benefactors, especially on holidays, and the children thought of him as their grandfather.